Hello, and welcome to this episode of Highlights from the Hill. This episode is a little bit different because our guest is actually our co-host, Superintendent Dr. Carol Cavanaugh. She recently gave a presentation to the HPS faculty and staff, and I thought it had some really good information. So thanks for being here to share that with us. Thank you. I like our new twist. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of different. It is. Uh, so yes, I, on opening day, I do what I've always done, and you know, you address all of the teachers as they come back, nurses, technicians, paraprofessionals, administrators, you know, really across the board, everyone who works in the public schools. And so you try to develop a message that's you know somewhat salient. And um, interesting for me, Jim, is that I'm always here, and we very often talk about data, whether it's test score data, enrollment data, budget data. And I think that the opening day speech is really geared to um, everyone in our schools looking at children as little people, yep. people who are individual, um, and people who are becoming young adults. And so I think that that's really where I tried to go with my opening address this year. Okay. Uh, when we do talk about enrollment, we talk about increased numbers. And I, I worry that sometimes our faculty or people at home, you know, get this idea that there's, you know, such overcrowding in the schools that, that what we're now delivering can't be excellent and I would argue that yes it can and it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the message on opening day was really expect excellence and I think that our teachers expect excellence, our paraprofessionals do, our administrators do, technology folks do and, and as long as that continues to happen those are the results that we will in fact get. So the question really becomes, how do we define excellence? And I don't want to get to a place where standardized test scores or achievement alone is what we're using to define excellence. So the way we defined it on opening day was to say we are better today than we were yesterday and better this year than we were last year. Now, where did you come up with that definition? So that is not really my definition. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, you can actually see the, on the slides. Uh, but over the summer, Jen Parson, the assistant superintendent, and I had an opportunity to hear Dr. Adolph Brown speak, mm -hmm. um, who uh, would also have presented in Hopkinton to all of our faculty and staff on Friday the 18th. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know we brought him here because I think his message is, is wonderfully profound. And so when he said to us, better today than yesterday, better this year than last, it really resonated with us. And so that's yeah. one of the messages he brings. Great. Yeah, it's exciting. So uh, interestingly, and I know that I used the slide and it certainly garnered a lot of laughter from, from my audience, uh, but if you look at this slide, you see an age-old problem, right? There are always very long lines outside of the ladies' rest facility and very short lines outside of the men's room. Um, it's clearly an institutional problem that could be solved, right? But instead of solving the problem, we sort of live with, with the problem in the way that it currently exists. And my argument or my presentation to teachers said, we don't have to take something that looks like um, a concern and, and not deal with it in appropriate ways. Um, so yes, we have a lot of students and we have a lot of students in our classrooms. When we have first grade classrooms with 23 and 25 kids, you know, clearly there, there's something that needs to be rectified, but it wasn't gonna be rectified on August 26, 2019. But it also wasn't such a problem that it was going to be insurmountable because I still believe we can expect excellence better today. And you know, I think this, this is extremely interesting um, and illustrative because this is, you could say, is a problem, but actually it, it is being handled. Like women are just having much more patience and they're getting through the problem without actually the problem being solved. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that. Um, better today than yesterday is really interesting because it's not just about managing or coping with the problem, it's actually addressing the problem. Yes, interestingly, uh, when I look at these pictures, it makes me think that in the Atlantic, there was an, actually an article <laughs> <laughs> mathematically resolving this issue for people. <laughs> um, but yes, it's sort of, you know, that old world conundrum and how do we, how do we get around it? So one of the things that I had shared with our fact, faculty is something about systems. And 
we can identify that we have issues, right? But I don't believe that our systems change because we identify them. They change because we disrupt them. And my challenge to them was, let's disrupt the system, right? If we have something that we look at as, all right, so there's not a classroom for this group of learners, or there's you know, 24 children in that class, or there are 30 kids in an AP class, you know, how do you disrupt that system? How do, we, how do we sort of get to a place where we say, we've fixed that within the constraints of, of our issues? Mm -hmm. I think a great example for me is the high school science department. Uh, if you've got 27 students in an AP chemistry class, for example. Some of the lessons now appear online. Uh, kids are still coming after school. Uh, there's all kinds of electronic communication that's happening between teachers and kids. So they have found ways to disrupt that system, mm -hmm. the system that used to look like a traditional classroom. And yet, our kids are still learning at very, very high levels while we're in this you know, sort of transitional stage. Mm. Uh, another thing that we have going on in our public schools uh, you can see on the slide, in 2014, the United States enrolled more non-white students in our public schools than white students. And here in Hopkinton, what we are finding is that we have students who are more now than ever before. Kids who are linguistically diverse, kids who are culturally diverse, racially diverse, economically diverse, um, kids who are socially, emotionally, and behaviorally needy, and kids who are very much unaware of how we in Hopkinton do school. And a lot of this comes just because we've had an influx of students. Mm -hmm. And so again, there are systems. And so I've encouraged our teachers to think about ways to uh, ensure that within the systems of their classrooms, they're not status quo. The systems are always ever changing to address all of the needs you see on that slide. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, sometimes just getting that first grader or that third grader to understand how it is that we do school, or that ninth grader, how it is that we do school, um, is, is one of our challenges. And I think that we are meeting those challenges because of the personnel that we have in our schools right now. Mm -hmm. um, they are very smart people. They are people who are willing to always go the extra mile. Um, and, and we're getting it done. Mm. And what's, what's your role in that? Like, do you organize um, meetings or um, people coming in and talking about these or uh, encouraging different strategies? How does that work? Sure. So there's you know, always professional learning. And I think... Uh, when, you know, when we look at some of our faculty, they are so aware of the kinds of professional learning that's out there mm -hmm. um, that often they seek it themselves. You know, okay. so anything that happens, I think, in um, the realm of special education, psychology, you know, people who work in those fields in our schools, they are they're very proactive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, there are also some of the other things that we've been doing. I think that uh, we, as an administrative team, have done an awful lot of work in um, looking at culture and diversity, um, some of our hiring practices. You know, we, we try to reach out to uh, people of diverse backgrounds to see if we can bring them in and become teachers in our district. And, you know, that's, it's slow going. It's a problem across Massachusetts, but it's one that, that we are actively addressing, I think, in, in uh, in pretty positive ways. Mm. Um, when we do work as an administrative team, you know, there have been some shared readings. Uh, those things end up going back to faculty meetings and um, professional learning that happens even within the schools at, in the, the teacher and paraprofessional levels. So it is starting sort of at the top and kind of working its way down, but we also have teachers among us who are exceptionally good at sort of understanding the diverse needs of kids. Mm -hmm. So I am grateful to the teaching force. Uh, another thing that I try to impress upon them is, you know, in addition to all of the needs, every single child in our school is really an individual child. Um, so everyone's excellence is different. And so a lot of what we need to do instructionally uh, surrounds uh, differentiation, getting to know our kids as individuals, and, and that is challenging work. Uh, this morning I had an opportunity to meet with a first grade teacher in the district and she said, it doesn't really matter if I have 24 kids in my classroom and yes, it might make it a little uh, more challenging to get to every student, but I do that. I want to sort of ensure that every kid feels welcomed and nurtured and um, supported every single day in my classroom and, and I believe that that is happening across our grade levels. I believe it is too because you know what I find is that the kids in this school system are very, very accepting 
of you know everybody at their own different uh, levels and abilities, and I think that really is a reflection upon the environment that the administration creates. Yes, and I think that we have um, equity as opposed to equality. So what we, we do is we, we are able to give kids what they need as individual children, as opposed to giving something to every single kid just because it's a service that we provide, mm -hmm. right? So I think we're very good at that kind of differentiation. And some of the needs are academic, and some of them are social, and some are emotional, and some are behavioral. Um, some are athletics, but whatever the, those needs are, you know, in our last show, we had our athletic director here who talked about all of the le levels of athletics that we offer to our kids so that many more kids are playing varsity level sports and many of our teams are doing, you know, most of our teams are going to postseason play. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, part of that equity piece that we're able to give kids what they need. Right. Uh, and this, I think, is, is one of the challenges as we look at this slide. So I've tried to impress upon teachers that every single student comes to us with a different personal history. We really don't know what that is. So getting to know our learners as individuals, not just, you know, Carol Cavanaugh's enrollment numbers, <laughs> uh, is what's really important. And um, that really comes from establishing relationships, trusting relationships, respectful relationships with the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had come up with that sort of metaphor of the figurative backpack, right? We don't really know what's in each of our, our kids' backpacks as they come into our classroom every day. Mm -hmm. And it's only through that ongoing communication between children and teachers that we start to kind of peel away at the onion, so to speak, to really arrive at a child's humanity. So one of the things I, I had done was I had shown sort of three stages of backpacking. You know, here's a little girl walking into the Marathon Elementary School, and you know, you only see the back of her there, but you see the enormity of that backpack. And sort of in that figurative sense, you know, she's probably coming in carrying all kinds of fear. This is my first day of school. Mm -hmm. What will it be like? Will my teacher be nice? Will I have friends? You know, and over time. Um, what's added to the backpack isn't just something that happens in school, right? It's things that happen to our kids at home or on soccer fields or with their peers. And little things keep getting added to the backpack. Some of those things are, are very positive and they give to kids that sort of little flavor of success that boosts their self-esteem and gives them sort of the confidence to kind of keep going. But at the same time, other things are added to students' backpacks. And you know, I think this is where a lot of the social, emotional, behavioral things that manifest as kids become older and older, we start to see it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are those challenges. You know, so you get to middle school and you don't make the team, or you lose a friend through betrayal, or those kinds of things. And, and while those things, I know, Parents and teachers hope our growing experiences, right, that we have that sort of resilience. Uh, a kid still carries it. And when you have an abundance of those things, does that really shatter or weaken or um, in some way um, diminish a, a child's confidence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, not every child has that experience, but some do. And I think it's just so important, you know, we always talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Kids need to feel safe and they need to be you know, nurtured and all those things before they can learn. One of the little phrases we often use is you need Maslow before you can bloom and the bloom refers to Bloom's taxonomy okay. of, you know, yeah. all of those things about understanding and knowledge and synthesis and evaluation and analysis and all that. Right. Um, but kids do need Bloom before they can, uh, Maslow before they can bloom. And yeah. so I think the metaphor of the backpack kind of plays into that as yeah. well, right? I also think it's really appropriate too that, you know, you can't see inside a backpack. Yes. And a lot of times the kids aren't opening their backpack for you. Yes, and most times they're not mm -hmm. opening the backpack. They kind of keep that stuff all bundled up yeah. and hidden. And, you know, it's not until, you know, a student really feels like things are unraveling that a teacher or a counselor or an administrator you know, a para, someone that they feel they can trust, becomes privy to the contents of the backpack. Mm -hmm. so, um, 
and kids are carrying an awful lot of baggage into our schools. You know, I give two examples on this slide, but obviously there are many, many more. Um, you know, here's a student who is that student tired of carrying the label of being the model minority, right? Is another student tired of sort of, you know, kind of keeping up pretenses even when that child is carrying the burden of, you know, socioeconomic difference? Right. Those things are, are very much alive and well in our schools. And while you see two examples on this screen, there are thousands of them. Mm -hmm. right. And I do think it makes it very challenging for kids. And it's only when we get to know them and sort of understand what the challenges are that we can address the challenges through some of those programs that we have that are equity or just through relationships. And that's what I really encouraged our teachers and, and faculty to do, is mm -hmm. to get to know your kids for these reasons. Uh, this uh, comes from a Cornelius Minor text. The, the name of the book is We Got This. And as an administrative team, we've taken just a smidge, uh, like just a little bite of the pie of the Cornelius Minor text. And I hope to get to more of it this year. But what Corm Cornelius Minor would tell teachers is that they do have an amazing superpower. Um, our, our teachers should question those rules, the policies, the procedures, the practices, and the customs that currently define their classrooms. So if there are things that they've been doing for years and years and years that don't work for a particular faction of kids, mm -hmm. it's time to think about disrupting that particular system. Right? And we've kind of taken a look with the backpacks of who are the kids? Right? We, we don't know until we discover who they are, and then we disrupt that system. Yeah. Uh, this, his second assertion is to identify any groups in your classroom who consistently benefit less, right? And we know that those kids are out there. Um, so how do we ensure that each one of those groups is getting what they need? And I, I would argue that the Hopkinton Public Schools does a beautiful job of providing all kinds of services, right? So if a child needs additional time in math, we provide that service. If a child needs additional time um, in, in reading or, you know, additional nurturing outside of the classroom. They become dysregulated and need a, a quiet space. We, we can provide almost anything a child needs. Mm -hmm. It's really it's really nice. Yeah. Um, and then his third one is to uh, change the way I do schools so that kids who belong to those groups have more opportunity to see, succeed. And I think as educators, we have sort of a way that we do school, right? We've, we've sort of become who we are as educators. And um, sometimes it's not about just changing ourselves, but changing ourselves for the needs of the kids. And so really, I had asked the teachers um, to join me in that quest to be who our students need us to be. Uh, you know that I sit here all the time and tell you about those numbers, but along with the, change, the increase in numbers, we have increases in student need. Now, we could put on this screen right now a pie chart of all of the different special education diagnoses we have, for example, in the district. We could put a pie chart of the more than 50 languages that our kids speak at home, right? Mm -hmm. um, we could put a pie chart of students' income on that screen. And you would just continue to see more and more disparity in our district. But I think that we're well poised to, to deal with that. I just put it out there for our teachers so that they are very understanding of our need to grasp it as an entire school community. Mm -hmm. So the reason I asked you to give yeah. this presentation here on the show is because when I was sitting in that auditorium and listening to this presentation, I just thought it was really, really profound because I don't know how many people know that a superintendent actually does stuff like this. They see you at the school committee meeting and you have the pie charts and you have the numbers and you're talking about numbers of classrooms and you know building sizes and, and how the bus routes work and things like that. And they know that you are in charge of this whole system, but this is something where you are actually speaking into the lives of the teachers who are carrying this forth. And I don't know if everybody realizes that you actually do this type of work. And I think it's really valuable. So a very long time ago, when I was still a teacher, um, I had a student, a former student, who had said to me, could he come in and just shadow my classes for the day because he was thinking about going into education. And I said, of course you can. And he had been a student who was a very, very high performing student who had probably taken 
you know, honors level courses and then, you know, my AP literature course or something like that. And so he had come in and he had seen me teach a journalism elective and he had teach me, seen me teach a, a foundational course. And at the end of the day, we were sort of just jibber jabbering and he said to me, you know what the most amazing thing about today was? Is that in every single period of the day, you're a different person. Mm. And I thought, well, you have to be a different person because the needs of the learners in front of you are very, very different mm -hmm. in each one of those settings. You know, and sometimes there's even a different personality need or a different curricular need. And you do keep changing yourself and the curriculum and your personality over and over again to mm -hmm. kind of get, meet the students where they are. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I think I mean when we say you know, excellence means that you're better today than you were yesterday, better this year than you were last year. Because I would have some kids at the high school level who are reading at a sixth grade level, right? But if they could read by the time they left uh, my classroom that year at a seventh grade or an eighth grade level, then they were better than they were last year. And mm -hmm. they were better today than they were yesterday. And that's what I think is profoundly important for us to remember, is that every kid's growth and individuality are just so critical. Right, right. And I, I just think that nothing can speak louder than the results that this school system produces. You know, it's like there's just such a healthy student body, you know, exploring and growing. And, and, and I just mean in more than just um, raw information, but just you know, in, in the caring for each other. There's, and I just think that when you look at Maslow's hierarchy, it's just, you know, Huffington is pretty high up there because at, at, although at the same time that you are just beginning to have to pay some serious attention to uh, growth and mm -hmm. numbers, you know, you're also keeping this on the forefront and encouraging the, the teachers to do that too. Yes, and I think while it's different, it's not really different. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, I think, the resources, we have the people who have these skills. You know, it's really just to draw attention to the fact that, you know, our, our school community has changed and we need to change along with it. We need to sort of disrupt any systems that aren't working. Yeah. But I think, you know, we're in, in a very good place to do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing that. Oh, is there another slide? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are only a couple more slides okay. left. Uh, so, you know, and when, it, at the end, I think, you know, it was just sort of ending with that, that kind of, you know, excitement, I guess, about asking our teachers to, you know, expect excellence and um, underscoring that notion that we are all products of what people expect us to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you talk about that sort of caring and nurturing and excellence that happens in our public schools. Um, I think that that happens because teachers expect it, you know. And, and I think when the teacher expects it, um, the kids expect it. You know, just recently an administrator said to me that he had uh, gone to school in Hopkinton, but then worked in another district. And when he came back here, he almost had to reorient himself. Mm. Because there is a very different kind of expectation for um, an academic, a civil, a behavioral, you know, and all of those kinds of norms that are yeah. outstanding here. But there's a care too. Mm -hmm. you know? When, when you ask anyone in this district to go the extra mile or to contribute. I mean, I guess a very good example for me now is a week ago I sent out an email to families uh, that was really sort of a wish list for the 18 to 22 program. And I cannot tell you how things are just pouring into the central office. Mm. So if they need toasters for measuring cups or, you know, headphones or any of those things yeah. that not only help with academics but with life skills, vacuum cleaners mm -hmm. they really are and it's it's very touching you don't usually feel that way about a vacuum cleaner <laughs> but in this case it's been it's been lovely yeah yeah um i asked our teachers to support one another because it's only with the strength of your colleagues that you get this sort of done so we are all rowing in the same direction i am hoping um i asked them to disrupt systems that aren't working for all of our kids i asked them for help when they need it you know, I think that in the same way that our kids have to feel healthy and safe in order to um, be able to succeed academically, athletically, or however the kids choose to do that, um, our teachers also need to practice some self-care. I asked them to make it a great school year to learn, create, and achieve, and I think together is the key word. So.
Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and that really, that really comes across because I see so much um, of teachers, you know, helping teachers when somebody needs something. There's a bunch of people coming in to help them out, and it also speaks to modeling for the students too. Um, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I, you know, and I guess I always say it, but I am, I feel like I'm very blessed to work with administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, nurses, you know, technicians, um, my central office staff, and you know, they are just amazing people who, who do yeah. an incredible job. Yeah. So, yeah, and mostly the students. <laughs> so you have this um, um, address that you did. Mm -hmm. to the faculty. What, do you have any other like touch points during the year or how else do you interact with, you know, casting the vision and, uh, and supporting them? Right, so it really is very difficult to get all of our teachers and, you know, staff into the same venue at one time. And so really the opening day is the only time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, on Friday the 18th when we were visited by Dr. Adolph Brown, it took an awful lot of sort of reconfiguration, um, work with the Teachers Association, work with Dr. Brown to be able to get all of our people under one roof again. I mean, that's, that's a huge anomaly during the school year. Yep. Um, but I think his messaging along these lines is just so powerful about ensuring that kids get what they need. And I think in a year like this, where we have so many new kids who have come to us so suddenly, mm. um, that kind of inspirational work is, is important to keep people going. Yep. Um, so I, I'm really excited about his message. And I think that um, it continues to propel people. Other than that, you really only have, you know, sort of email blasts or school committee presentations or this show, Highlights from the Hill. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you don't really get to be in a room with everyone. So, you know, you pop into schools, pop into classrooms and thank yeah. teachers for the visit. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for our time. Thank you so much for um, sharing that information. Thank you. It, it was really my pleasure. And I'm glad that, you know, it kind of gets out there so that parents are able to see what we're doing in the schools as well, so, and All what right. our belief system looks like. Great. All right, I'll see you next time. See you next time. And thank you for joining us for this episode, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Highlights from the Hill. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get in a $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you.